then there may be some out there who believe we spend too much time on cultural issues on this show. But I would counter by saying that nothing matters more. Remember, humans are highly adaptable creatures. What seems absolutely harebrained and crazy right now soon becomes normal, and we forget what life was like before. Just think about the crazy hoops we all jumped through for COVID that eventually seemed second nature, no matter how ineffective and ridiculous we knew them to be. Or the fact that we just expect clean water, air, food on the table, reliable transport and quality medical care, and freedom of speech. Priceless gifts our ancestors just a few generations back would have thought reserved just for royalty. And sometimes even royalty wouldn't have had access to the kind of technology that, say, would save their own child's life from deadly diseases that we today see as no big deal because they're highly treatable. Imagine going back in time to the 1850s, let's say, and trying to explain how normal and easy it is for people to pack into metal tubes that hurdle at breakneck speeds on highways and cars or in the skies over 30,000 feet up in airplanes. But you don't even need to go back that far. Just go back to the presidential campaign season of 2008 when California voted down same-sex marriage and Barack Obama campaigned on traditional marriage. Two things that are absolutely unthinkable today, less than 15 years later. And now young people today are growing up in a world where they don't remember Obama talking about marriage being a union before God of a man and a woman. And if you did tell them, they think you're lying because only evil, irredeemable bigots believe that, right? We must remember that young people today under the age of 20 are increasingly coming into a world in which they have no memory of a time before men could be women and before sexuality became an amorphous, hedonistic mess taught to kindergartners who are also, by the way, coached into open racism against certain groups for the supposed benefit of a different group. Now try and rely on common sense to talk tax policy or foreign policy with someone like that. Someone who's had it drilled into their head since birth to not trust your eyes or common sense because, hey, for all you know, that big dude down the street with a beard could be a prim and proper lady. That's the cold, hard realism of why this matters so much, why I harp on it all the time. But it's also of paramount spiritual importance, and that's the biggest reason why I will keep on talking about these issues. As prolific author Anthony Esselin argues at Chronicles Magazine, Endless war with no aim against all that is good and orderly is the hallmark of Satan, the adversary and the accuser. He writes, quote, The progressive does not examine his own conscience. That dark room is full of mice and spiders. He does not want to sweep those corners. He wants, quote unquote, change, a restlessness that distracts him from his real evils. Inspire Change reads a tab on the NFL's website, not marry your child's mother, live modestly, or Break your favorite filthy habit. Everyone from the cow-eyed sociology major to Hitler, from the drag queen at the local library to publisher Larry Flint, wants to make the world a better place. Nobody wants to do the dishes or change the baby's diaper. Confess your sins? No fire in that. Better to confess other people's. How dare you, cries the adolescent girl from Sweden. The good that I would, I do not, the Apostle Paul said in his epistle to the Romans, laying bare the contradiction at the heart of fallen man. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Who will deliver us from this body of death, not the harried and herring progressive? He plays for confusion, so does sin itself, end quote. The father of lies gets you to do evil by making you think that you're doing good. However, if the supposed good you are fighting for takes Machiavellian tactics like lying, deception, and fomenting hatred against scapegoats, then it's not ordered toward God. Only God can create whole cloth out of nothing. Satan can only pervert and destroy what already exists. Hence the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Our friends over at Accuracy and Media have a new series releasing this week showing how school officials are getting wise to the righteous anger of parents and are now changing their messaging in order to hide things like critical race theory from them. First up was Idaho. Take a look. Critical race theory is incredibly divisive and incredibly unpopular. It started out in higher education, but now parents across the country are fearful 
that the racist Marxist tenets of critical race theory have found their way into K-12 schools. In response, politicians in seven states have banned critical race theory from being taught to children. A dozen other states are considering doing the same. But as we discovered in our investigation in Idaho, simply banning critical race theory isn't enough to stop the unaccountable bureaucrats of public education. So what? So this dumb new law doesn't mess with you guys? Not yet. No. It's so emotional learning. We can't say that here anymore. It's mental health. Oh, sorry. So. Yes. Oh my God. No, we did have a big. She already came for it. We already had a big blow up with that. So we still do. We just call it mental health. So it's just you know our mental health curriculum. Okay. And Who's against mental health curriculum? Not me. Right. Okay. No. If you are, then that really is a real issue. <laughs> then you need mental health care. Yes, you do. Yeah. So we're trying we're trying to make that transition um, to, you know. That's no, probably a bad word to mention here, too. It's all mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. It's just all the different words you have to use. And, of course, we don't do C. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. So, yeah. Yeah. We're just learning how to worm around all of those weird things that are out there. Social and emotional learning is often a Trojan horse to push critical race theory into classrooms. But many parents now have caught on to that fact. As a result, some teachers have had to adapt. I just went to a superintendent's meeting last week and the district was intentional to switch out uh, social emotional learning to uh, behavior adaptations. Like they just hmm. changed the name? Changed the label, huh. same stuff. And I thought, it's kind of a bummer they have to do that, but yes. on the same hand, it's kind of brilliant. Heck yeah. <laughs> because they don't care about this, even though it's the same as this, but it's the label. And joining us now to discuss is Adam Gillette, the president of Accuracy in Media. Thanks for being here tonight, Adam. Me. Great. So what got you guys thinking that this might be the case, that some schools were going to start finding some workarounds to parental activism and new state laws against CRT and genderqueer ideologies? Well, we all know that government employees, bureaucrats, are generally unaccountable. Even when caught doing heinous things, they simply can't be fired. So we had a hunch that when seven states banned critical race theory from being taught in classrooms, it wasn't as if all of a sudden these radical progressive administrators and teachers would suddenly say, Aw shucks, I can't teach those Marxist racist ideas anymore. But instead, we assumed they would likely ignore it. So we investigated in a variety of states. I've been to dozens and dozens of school districts, and I've barely found a place yet where they've told us that the law changed things. And so the video we just watched from was from Idaho, and then today you were releasing a video from Tennessee. So as you were mentioning, these are by and large red states. And so these are states that I think a lot of parents think, okay, we can, you know, maybe relax, you know, it won't be as bad in our state. Hey, this isn't California after all. And yet here and again, it, it's pretty much the same. Are you surprised really just how far reaching this left wing indoctrination goes? I am, and parents need to be surprised. I think parents often view their schools the way we view our congressmen. Nobody likes Congress as a whole. The popularity rating for Congress as a whole is terrible. But people think my congressman's the good guy. I think public education is viewed the same way. I met my child's teacher and administrators. They seem like swell people. They want what's best for my kid. Well, what they view as what's best for your child might be dramatically different from what you view as best for your child. And they will twist terms, they will ignore laws in order to push their ideas onto the youth today. It's really terrifying. It really is. I mean, and it's not even just these teachers, though, of course, they have outsized power and control over kids in the classroom. But also, I was just looking at some of the headlines today. I have one here. Uh, the Public Library Association's National Conference didn't know they had one, but I guess they do. And they're teaching teachers how to, quote unquote, what they say, queer the library. And they also say the Dewey Decimal System is racist, so we need to change things up. Uh, for parents who are watching the videos that you guys are putting out at Accuracy in Media, is there any kind of action you'd like them to take? Well, the most important thing I think any th parent could do would be to advocate for school choice. Even if you don't choose to pull your kid out of traditional public schools, the competition will force traditional public schools to do a better job. There are so many states that have either considered banning critical race theory or have banned critical race theory and are currently considering school choice. Rural Republicans are the ones who often block it because public education is the biggest employer in their district. Well, we went to those rural areas and we found that many of them are teaching critical race theory Anyway, 
in rural conservative areas. So if you value public education in America, tell your elected officials to advocate for it and vote for it. We have an action alert on our website, aim.org, where anybody can send one message that's automatically routed to your officials and you can tell them that your children deserve school choice. You know, we think we're used to some of these buzzwords like CRT or radical gender ideology and the list goes on. But in the video we just saw, uh, they were also talking about social emotional learning. And some parents are starting to catch on to that lingo as well. They're starting to talk about it at some of these, you know, uh, school board meetings. So we heard some of the teachers in that video saying, hey, we don't even use that term anymore. Uh, so for viewers out there who may be unaware of what this next new buzzword is, what is social em emotional learning? Social and emotional learning is often, but not always, a Trojan horse for critical race theory. It's used to push those gender and racial ideas that parents don't necessarily think that teachers are qualified to teach. So now, because they've gotten some flack for it, one administrator told us that instead of calling it social and emotional learning, they simply call it mental health because that doesn't raise a red flag. Personally, I wonder, in a world in which our public schools do a terrible job, of teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, what makes them think they're qualified to teach mental health? Where's their certification for that? My gosh. But that's what we've seen again and again. Similarly, if the 1619 Project, that horribly flawed, inaccurate version of history from the New York Times, if it's banned in your state, well, no big deal for these administrators. Many of them now subscribe to a new service called Newzella. Parents haven't heard of Newzella. They're not afraid of it. Well, Newzella is a partner of the 1619 Project, and they share that content in the classrooms simply under the name of Newzella. And it's really so sad, like you said, I mean, these are not mental health professionals by and large. And just the other day, we were covering a tragic story of a young girl named Yaley Martinez uh, and her mother who was telling her story. And she's a young girl who, as a teenager, was dealing with a lot of depression and low self-esteem and, you know, other things that young girls deal with at that age. And at her school in Los Angeles, uh, they had, of course, LGBTQ and all these different activist left-wing groups. And when they got their clutches on her, they told her, no, you're really a boy. Your name's Andrew, she thought her name would be. Uh, and so they really, you know, well, uh, played her like that. And sadly, she ended up running away from home. CPS gets involved, takes her away from the mother. The mother's not allowed to even talk about God in the presence of the social workers with her own daughter. And then her daughter ends up taking her own life. And that's why this is so serious, because lives are on the line, especially when it comes to something like mental health and teenagers and how this gets basically played with for left wing agendas. I mean, that's really the, the, the scariest aspect of, of all of this. And that's what uh, breaks my heart. And so Quickly, before I let you go tonight, I just have to ask you, uh, Merrick Garland, he's going after any parents who are speaking up about this. Are you afraid he might go after you and give you the old Project Veritas treatment for uncovering this? Well, we always expect that sort of thing, but you're only getting shot at when you're flying over the target. So when the bad people go after us, that merely means that we've put frowns in their faces, and that puts joy in my heart. Adam, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me.